People claim to have witnessed miraculous events. It was some miracle that had saved my life. Even some skeptics have been turned into true believers. I am saying to you that from the scientific point of view, we could demonstrate that Nancy Fowler has really mystical experiences. Miracles, can they happen? Or are they the products of overactive imaginations? Can ordinary people tap into the power to heal the sick? Are apparitions messages from higher powers? At the dawn of a new millennium, such questions are being asked as the need seems to be intensifying for the belief in miracles. To me, a miracle is a happening where God intervenes. It's something that's not uh, natural, but uh, it happens. And I've experienced, you know, this through my lifetime. April 12th, 1944. Marilyn Weber, distraught over the terminal illness of a dear friend, absent-mindedly lingers on the railroad tracks in her hometown of Wheaton, Illinois. I got to the last set of tracks and I was shaken out of my lethargy to find a train coming right at me. It was so close that I could see the blue eyes of the engineer. I tried to move. I tried to get off the tracks. I couldn't move. I was actually frozen in fear. Standing on the track, realizing in a few minutes I'm going to be dead. The train barrels toward Marilyn. Certain death is imminent. Then, according to Marilyn, something astounding occurs. I was pushed from behind with the greatest force I've ever felt. Not only went off the tracks, but down the siding, all the way to the road. When I realized it was still alive, it was bloody but still alive, I thought I've got to get back up on that track and thank whoever saved my life. And I got up there, and there was nobody there. But in my heart, I had the realization that God had sent an angel, a miracle had happened, because I, my life was, was saved. In 1997, when 66-year-old Aida Warren is diagnosed with a brain tumor, she knows exactly what she must do. Immediately, I came here to the Holy Hill and lay down on the stone cross where the crucifix is and pray to Jesus. I went back to have my test done again. And I was relieved when my doctor called me that the brain tumor was not there. Did Aida Warren receive a spontaneous healing? Did Marilyn Weber actually experience a miracle? Do these extraordinary kinds of events happen, or are they merely happenstance? I think happenstance is a, is a, is a thing that does happen. Uh, you're at the right place at the right time, something happens, and you, you, you escape what you, you felt would be a sure death. The very notion of miracles stirs a fascination in people of all backgrounds and beliefs. Tales of miracles, visitations by angels, and miraculous healings have been woven into the fabric of human existence since our earliest recorded histories. The Bible refers to these remarkable abilities as gifts. The Bible itself does not say that gifts are just given for any reason, it says they're given as a sign to prove that the one working the miracle is speaking from God. Now personally, I, I accept the fact that God still works miracles. And uh, I believe I've seen some uh, acts of healing. Angels have been making a comeback in popularity. And I think many people are looking for some form of guidance and an angel is a preferable guide to a demon and I think they are trying to find some direction forward and the angel hopefully helps them in that quest. Some believe history's greatest healer and miracle worker was Jesus Christ. 
The Bible chronicles his many supernatural feats. He came to the pool of Bethesda. There were many, many people that were sick and lame there. He picked one. He picked the one that was the most deformed and crippled. And uh, Jesus simply asked him, do you wish to be healed? And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your pallet and go on walking. And it says he literally leaped to his feet. The story of Lazarus is another example of Jesus' astonishing gift for miracles. As the tale is recounted in the book of John, chapter 11, Jesus pays a visit to his friend Lazarus, dead for four days, his body placed in a cave behind a heavy rock. He said, roll back the stone. And when they did, he simply shouted out, Lazarus, come forth. And it said that he came forth wrapped in his grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Jesus and his disciples are said to have performed numerous miracles and healings during their lifetimes. But the Bible is not the last word on this kind of extraordinary event. I have heard people say that uh, miracles kind of stopped when all the apostles had died and Christ had died. There were no more miracles because miracles were needed only to begin the church. And from that point on, nothing like that ever happened. I don't believe that's true at all. History has shown that mystics, visionaries, and miracle healers often arise from the unlikeliest of places. This was certainly true for the celebrated Edgar Cayce. Cayce is born on a farm outside the tiny town of Hopkinsville, Kentucky in 1877. From an early age, he speaks of having visions and being able to commune with deceased relatives and angels. Casey's life transforms during adolescence, when the youngster experiences a remarkable apparition during a day of outdoor Bible study. An angelic figure appeared to him in this vision. And it was soon after that vision that he heard a little voice within him one night when he was studying his school books and really having trouble learning his lessons. And the voice said that if he would just put the books under his pillow and sleep on them, something wonderful might happen. And he discovered by sleeping on his books that he kind of had a photographic memory or he would have memorized the content of the lessons that were there. Casey's next spiritual encounter comes years later in a terrifying way. At the age of 21, his voice suddenly disappears. After nearly a year of silence, Casey gives up hope of ever speaking again when a traveling hypnotist takes an interest in his case. So this hypnotist hypnotized Edgar Casey, and sure enough, while he was in trance, he could speak in a normal voice. But once he was taken out of the hypnotic trance, he still had laryngitis. So they tried again, but this time while he was under hypnosis, the hypnotist asked him to describe what was wrong with his vocal cords and he began to use medical terminology and describe the problem and a remedy that when they followed it in days later led to a full healing. After that, Casey refines this ability that allows him to enter a hypnotic trance, then diagnose illnesses and prescribe healing treatments for others. Edgar Casey would lie down on a couch and he would put his hands up over his forehead and then when he felt himself moving into this altered state of awareness, that for him would be a lot like drifting off to sleep. He would move his hands down over his solar plexus. And when his wife would see him moving into that state, she would read to him a suggestion that he move in consciousness to be able to perform whatever kind of reading was needed that day. A stenographer often stands by to record Casey's impressions while in this sleep-like state on the borders of the unconscious. And a typical reading might last anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes or more. And then when it was finished, his wife would read to him a suggestion that he regain his normal waking consciousness, and it would look much like a man waking up from a nap. 
When some of Casey's patients begin to get better, word of his abilities quickly spreads. He first came to public attention by his ability to provide many cures for people and they could be hundreds of miles away. And he could work out their symptoms and give them remedies f to how to cure, cure their illnesses. Local doctors are amazed by Casey's miraculous abilities. But his gifts don't receive widespread acclaim until 1910, when the New York Times runs a two-page story on Casey, dubbing him the Sleeping Prophet. Suddenly, the boy from the small Kentucky town is in demand all over the country. Though Casey is a photographer by profession, his prophecy and healing work gradually come to dominate his life. Although he has a family to feed, Casey's sense of commitment to his visionary ability compels him to pursue his mystical journey. Edgar Casey was clear that this ability that he had was a gift from God. He also believed in reincarnation and felt that as a soul he had been here before and worked with this gift and really had honed the talent over several lifetimes. But that ultimately this was a gift and with it came great responsibilities. In 1922, Casey decides to follow an intuition and moves his family to Virginia's eastern seaboard to continue his healing. Within a few years, Casey gathers the financial backing to build the Casey Hospital for Research and Enlightenment. Casey envisions a unique facility that could provide the holistic care that he often prescribes in his intuitive readings. People came from all over the world to get physical readings from Edgar Casey, and there was a physician and a nursing staff and people got treated right in this building the way the Casey Health Readings said to be treated. Some of Casey's most effective readings concern treatments for patients afflicted with psoriasis, a painful skin condition. Casey, for example, gave readings on psoriasis to several dozen different individuals in his own era who had this awful skin disease. And out of those readings there are common elements of a holistic treatment procedure that we are working with now in a research setting and getting some wonderful results where people have not been able to find any relief from traditional treatment and yet this skin condition is being cured. Though he is most famous as a healer, Casey ultimately expands his visionary insights. He looks far beyond the everyday concerns of personal health and dares to divine the details of the future awaiting mankind. In the latter half of his 43 years of working as a professional intuitive, he began to broaden the scope of types of readings that he gave. He began to interpret dreams. He began to give spiritual advice about life purpose. He began to give instruction about prayer and meditation to look back into prehistory, uh, to look into the future. Some of Casey's visions of the future have proven surprisingly accurate, such as his early prediction of the 1929 stock market crash, and his foretelling in 1936 of a world at war against Germany and Japan. Other predictions still await the test of time. Edgar Casey, as a visionary or a seer, saw many things about what may happen to us as we approach the new millennium. He first of all spoke of a 40-year time of testing that would be just before the beginning of the new millennium, in which there would be many, many changes for our world, and we might gradually begin to see certain earth changes. Casey's prophecies carry striking messages and alarming warnings for those willing to listen. Casey describes a world racked by cataclysmic changes. He speaks of land arising, coming up out of the Atlantic Ocean. He talks about a shifting of the poles of the Earth, rotational axis of the Earth. He also foresaw many interesting things for the turn of the centuries, including the return of the lost continent of Atlantis, major earth changes where great swathes of North, North America, Japan and Europe vanish underneath the seas. 
The visions Casey detailed could already be well underway. Yet these predictions seem restrained when considered in the light of one of Casey's most startling dreams. He saw himself born again in the year 2158, so it was the 22nd century, and he was living in Nebraska as a boy, and he remembers in this dream that the seacoast came all the way to Nebraska. Despite the bleak outlook of Casey's prophecies, some experts caution that the visions do not offer a definitive outcome, but just one possibility of what our future can hold. And so in Edgar Casey's prophecy, there was always the sense that we are shaping and creating the future. And so even his visions of destruction for the world, or for parts of the world, I think were really just a way of him reading what was likely to happen if we continued down a certain pathway that he was afraid we might follow. There are others who remain unconvinced of Casey's healing and psychic abilities. I listen to Edgar Casey's stuff and I've read a lot of his material and if you look at it critically, you find so many holes in it that you begin to doubt the whole thing. Edgar Casey died in 1945. His fascinating yet controversial healings and prophecies still draw visitors to the Casey facility in Virginia. Here, believers and skeptics alike conduct research into the supernatural to determine if the humble mystic from Kentucky indeed knew which path humanity might follow. I believe a miracle is any time you in heaven touch. A time when you know that you know that you know that God has put his hand on you for a special reason. Over the centuries, many have claimed to witness miracles in the form of visitations from apparitions of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. The most infamous of these events occurs in Portugal in 1917. Three shepherd children report that the Virgin Mary appeared to them on six different occasions in the tiny village of Fatima. The Virgin Mary's message to them warns that the First World War would be ending, but a second, more terrible war would occur if mankind did not turn back to God. These events come to be known as the Messages of Fatima. On October 13th of that year, more than 70,000 people gather in Fatima in hopes of witnessing another apparition of the Virgin Mary. Believers and non-believers alike watch in awe as the sun seems to dance and change shape and size before their eyes. But modern-day skeptics profess doubt due to a lack of corroborating proof. These people say the sun is spinning closer and closer to the earth and on and on and on it goes. No observatory had any record of this. No one else saw it except this group of people there. In the 1980s, Nancy Fowler is working as a registered nurse when she begins to have strange and mystical experiences. In February and November of 1987, the image of Jesus Christ appears to her, giving Nancy the following mission to bear witness that I am the living Son of God. Uh, these apparitions are very similar to Fatima. They occur on the 13th, and the, the message is very similar. It's a peace plan. For the sake of this sorrowful passion. The messages from this series of visions leads Nancy to a house outside of Atlanta, where she builds an altar of stones and a wooden cross on the hill behind the home. The words that I received along with many visions. Since October of 1990, Nancy claims that an apparition of the Virgin Mary has appeared to her on the 13th of every month, bringing messages about the future of mankind and how the world can find peace. Yet remain with you. The clock continues to tick. The hour is rapidly approaching when one disaster after another will befall you. Repent. Repent, repent. If you have ears, open them. If you have eyes, open them and come back to me. Please, dear children. 
Sometimes I come alone and sometimes I come with many friends and sometimes I come with one friend. I come here because it's a very peaceful place. I feel very spiritually renewed when I come here. After thousands of believers like Kathy McCall flock to Holy Hill to hear these messages, Nancy is subsequently directed to what is now called the farm at Conyers, Georgia. More than one million people have made a pilgrimage to the site, with many claiming mystical experiences or healings. There have been a number of miracles that we have witnessed here, and we do have photographs of the white statue of the mother turning into human skin tone face. I have seen the sun spin like hundreds of others have and change in number and different colors from uh, natural light to gold to silver to blue to pinkish and then back to regular color. Um, and, and this is my testimony and it's true. But you know, these are signs that are not as important as the message. I've had so many metals and stuff has turned gold in my hands. It's incredible. And it's ongoing. The belief and the presence is very, very strong here. But there again, it's faith that's going to speak. If you don't have the faith, they'll never have the faith. If you got the faith, faith will move mountains, and it does. Dr. Richard Castanon comes to the farm seeking more than faith. He needs verifiable proof. Well, I am a man who studies the brain, the behavior, and because I was atheist and I was curious in the case, I wanted to know what happens when a person says, I am seeing the Blessed Mother or Jesus. In 1993, Castanon is part of a team that conducts a series of medical and scientific tests on Nancy while the appearance of an apparition is taking place. Castanon is stunned by what he finds. If you ask any doctor here in the States and you say, can you produce delta waves when you are awake talking, he will say, no, never. Delta waves you produce only when you are under deep sleep, like in a coma state. And Nancy produces that waves during the apparition. I am saying to you that from the scientific point of view, we could demonstrate that Nancy Fowler has really mystical experiences. In 1995, while visiting Bolivia, Nancy claims Jesus appeared to her, saying, I will leave a sign of my presence in this country. The following day in Cochabamba, Bolivia, a statue of Christ begins to cry and bleed. These kinds of bizarre events and apparitions have occurred throughout the world. What I think is interesting about these Marian apparitions is that s many of them have occurred in countries which are not Christian. Mary presumably appeared on the top of a mosque somewhere in the Middle East where thousands and thousands of people saw her, not one of whom was Christian. And her message was um, simply that she is coming for all people. Among the countless other sightings of Jesus and the Virgin Mary is one that has been appearing on the side of a finance building in Clearwater, Florida since December of 1996. Some claim it is a miracle. Others offer another explanation. Well, what it is is an image cast by oils and waters from the sprinkler system and palm trees in front of the building that looks like the Virgin Mary, and there in the parking lot you'll see people there to be healed in their wheelchairs and so on. To cynics and skeptics, these so-called miraculous visions are easily explained away. But for true believers, they are occurrences that must be heeded and respected. We've witnessed miracles. We've seen things happen uh, to people both physically, uh, spiritually, and oftentimes there, there isn't uh, any explanation other than miraculous. So uh, you don't really end up with much choice except to believe after you see certain things take place. The race toward the millennium has triggered an explosion of interest in the mystical realm. 
As the New Age movement rockets to prominence, it makes headlines and front page news. The 1987 Harmonic Convergence provides a flashpoint for the growing spirituality movement. It is a celebration of the coming transition from the Piscean to the Aquarian Age, defined as a time of peace and enlightenment. Then in the mid-1990s, author James Redfield writes the runaway bestseller, The Celestine Prophecy. Redfield's fictional book of spiritual discovery includes guideposts for the secret to life and suggests that spontaneous healing, intuition, energy fields, and other paranormal phenomena are natural and increasingly a part of the way humans have always been destined to live. The principles outlined in Redfield's chart-topping book are in many ways embodied in the spiritualist camp of Casadega, Florida. Founded by trance medium George Colby in 1894, the camp is the oldest such establishment in the southeastern U.S. and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Here on 57 acres of land, nearly a hundred mediums and spiritualists conduct daily healings of visitors and lead studies of reincarnation, mysticism, astrology, and other topics. It began when founder George Colby was led to this campsite by what he claimed were supernatural forces. Uh, he was a trans medium and traveled around the country. In a vision, he was told that he would found a community for like-minded people in Florida. Colby was known as the seer of spiritualism, a belief system that present-day faithful describe as part science, part philosophy, and part religion. Spiritualism is characterized by a firm belief in life everlasting. According to the mediums of Casadega, early spiritualist Colby was a trailblazer in many respects. As a trance medium, he was actually a person that was pioneering and illuminating people that there is life hereafter. And the prime directive, I suspect, at that time was to give messages of encouragement and of guidance. Though Colby soon scaled back his own medium work, the camp he established later became a focal point for a growing movement of spiritual seekers. By the 1920s, most of the homes currently on the site were constructed. And as the years passed, the needy, the afflicted, even the skeptical began coming in droves. Today, the spiritualist camp at Casadega, a Seneca Indian word for rocks beneath the water, is home to dozens of licensed mediums who perform healings on visitors. The community is strict about maintaining standards for its mediums. In order to become a medium here in Casadega, you go through many years of study. You have to go through the curriculum, plus you work on demonstration. And there are three committees that you have to pass. You also have to give evidentiary proof of your gift, which is judged by the certification committee. And then the ministerial council looks at the ecclesiastical side of what you're doing and, and, and who you are. So it isn't something that just happens here. And we have mediums here who have studied for 12 to 20 years before they become certified. All of us have that instinct to a certain extent in this energy. It's how we choose to use it. We all are different levels at different times. Is it even possible that the gift of healing begins simply by following one's own intuition? Mediumship is the ability to communicate. Each and every one of us have that ability. We have that gut feeling. If we follow that gut feeling, we always get steered clear of problem areas. If we don't, we usually get ourselves into some hot water or something. Many of the mediums living and working at Casadega have inspiring and astonishing stories to relate about healings that have supposedly occurred at their camp. A girl came in that had scars on her hand. She was about a 12-year-old girl. And I mean, she had bad, bad scars. I had her hold her hand out, and I visualized 
the scar is going away. And we held there for about five minutes. And when she withdrew her hand, the scars were gone. I think that that might be classified as a miracle at that time, but now I know it's a function of natural law because we were both visualizing it to be cleaned and cleared. Yet even though the mediums at Casa Dega can cite success stories of miraculous healing, they caution their visitors not to abandon conventional medicine. I want you to go to the doctors. If you need to go to the doctors, I I'll be right with you on that. But also, if you've been to the doctors a hundred times and they're not going anywhere, I want you to come to me also. And let's see what other path you might want to adventure to. Because, you know, there's all kinds of healing out there. And usually I'm called in when the medical field can't figure out what to do. More than 70,000 visitors pass through Casa Dega each year. Not all of them arrive with an open heart or mind. Yet the unique experience of visiting the camp often changes them. One of the amazing things is that the people who come, the skeptics who come, leave believers. We're not here to convince you, we're here to serve where we can. The mystics and mediums of Casa Dega see the coming millennium as a time of great spiritual awakening and healing, not necessarily a time of catastrophe and destruction. I personally believe in the divine law. And I do not feel that there's going to be a big disaster thing that's going to wipe out all. We have disasters. That will always be. But the year 2000, the new millennium coming in, will be a lot what people want it to be in thoughts. The mediums of Casa Dega claim that life is eternal and that higher intuition and the power of healing can be harnessed by all of us. According to Gallup, most people do believe in miracles. And more interesting, uh, most people have begun to believe in miracles over the last decade or so. Are miracles indeed occurring more as we move closer to the millennium? Or is this perception the construct of our overactive imaginations? Could miraculous events be happening all around us every day? I think people often miss the miracles in their lives because they're probably looking for huge things or because they feel unworthy to even ask. Miracles seem to take all forms, from the most unfathomable coincidences to astounding twists of fate. Some seem to have no possible rational explanation, or perhaps they do. Miracles are, by their nature, an amazing happening which can't be explained at that moment in time, but with the benefit of study and hindsight, they do become a bit, they may well have rational explanations. Still, many researchers feel that even scientific explanations do not explain away all of these events. I think the danger of modern science is that it's become a kind of religion in its own right. Science has got too big for its own boots. It is a valuable part of our lives, but it needs to be cut down to size. And we need to realize that there's so much else out there which is not accessible to science. I think that um, there are more reports of angels and miracles now, not only because there are more, I do think there are more, but also because people are more willing to stand up and say, um, I've had a miracle, I've had something wonderful, I've had a healing. I think that the stigma or fear of sharing such things is kind of gone. During the past several decades, numerous books, magazines, and newsletters have chronicled events that have come to be called modern medical miracles. 
Author Barbara Schliemann claims to have witnessed one while she was caring for a woman named Shirley who was dying from liver disease. My first experience with miracles, uh, I was working as a nurse in a small hospital in northern Illinois, caring for a woman who is in her early 30s was dying of alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. And I remember how difficult it was to care for her because she was in a coma. Doctors believe Shirley has less than 24 hours to live. Barbara becomes surprised when a fellow nurse approaches her with a distinctly non-medical idea. She said, you know, I don't believe that Shirley's supposed to die this way. I believe in miracles, and I believe that if we pray for her, that everything would be all right. Well, I thought that was the most irrational and unscientific thing I had ever heard another nurse say. The nurse arranges for a priest to come in and give Shirley a blessing of the sick but Barbara remained skeptical. All night long, I, I wrestled with myself. You know, should I have stopped that from going on? Shouldn't I have taken more time to talk to the husband about his wife's death? Came back on duty the next day at 11 o'clock as I was walking down the hallway. I went past Shirley's room, and I noticed that somebody was sitting up in the, in the bed, and I said, she expired during the night. We put another patient in there. And then I looked a little closer. It was Shirley sitting up eating. And this was a person we'd been feeding intravenously for six weeks. She's eating, she's talking to some of the nursing staff and her husband. Even Shirley's doctors are awestruck at her overnight recovery. One physician said, we didn't do this, God did. And he was the first one willing to qualify this as a miracle. She went home from the hospital three weeks later with a new liver. It had completely regenerated and it wasn't a liver transplant. God had given her a new liver. Is this a miraculous healing or simply an extraordinary recovery that modern science cannot yet fully explain? Author Joan Wester Anderson tells of another alleged medical miracle that happened to a friend of hers. Jean Doctor had a beloved husband who had never been sick a day in his life. And one day he came down with a mysterious malady. Jean's husband has fallen into a coma. Doctors warn her that the end is near. Late one night, Jean is holding vigil in her husband's room when she is startled by a strange elderly woman. She said, um, we need to sit Brother John up because we're going to give him communion. Well, Jean thought, Brother John, uh, her husband's name was John, but Brother John? And who is this person? And did people in intensive care even get Holy Communion? And how did this woman know that John was Catholic? And all these questions went through her mind, but the biggest one was, well, John can't sit up, he's in a coma. Well, strangely, she kind of pulled John and, and he sat up. He received communion, the woman blessed him and said, you'll be fine, and kind of wafted out of the room. Later, Jean is shocked when she speaks to one of the nurses on duty. The nurse said, I've been sitting here the entire time. I can see all of these doors, including yours. No one's been in or out of any of these rooms. They're not permitted to. And when she went back into the intensive care unit, her husband was sitting up. The color was back in his cheeks. and. He asked Jean, why am I here? I want to go home. Well, they never did find out what his illness was, and they never found out what um, uh, cured it, except Jean said uh, she never got a chance to thank that angel, but she thinks the angel knows. Angels? Medical miracles? Or did these people harness the power of the mind? The body has the potential for healing itself. There's a great deal to be said for positive thinking. And uh, of course, faith is a positive thinking. It says that something can happen and the body may respond or the mind and the body respond. And of course, some medical diseases go into reversal automatically. So I, I think there are good naturalistic explanations for these healings. Science may never be able to fully explain some of these extraordinary occurrences. Yet even for true believers, some of these incidents must be examined fully and completely before they are pronounced as miracles. I think that a healthy skepticism is good. Uh, not everything that glitters is gold. And uh, I don't think that 
we necessarily have to accept everything that people tell us as being true. But others swear that these astounding events are indeed supernatural occurrences. I think more people were realizing uh, they can't just live for me, myself, and I. Many of the baby boomers are finding that out. And they realize there, has, there is another dimension. There is a God, a, a creator. And the God is performing these miracles and sending angels, I think, to get our attention. There lies a yearning in the human soul to try and make sense of our often senseless world. When the explanations of logic and science don't suffice, we sometimes seek our answers in the spiritual or supernatural realms. The heated debate over the mysteries of miracles and miraculous healings is as old as time, and will no doubt continue for centuries to come.